Wow. Thank you very much, uh, uh, meeting organizers, for making this whole event possible. And it's a joy to share the stage here with uh, good friends and, and colleagues. Um, I am going to share with you uh, some of the focus of my talk is going to be on environmental uh, aspects of a farming systems experiment, experiment that we have at Ohio State. Um, I hope we have time. I'm going to try to talk fast so we do have time for some of the, uh, the, the social questions that need to be addressed in organic farming research. Uh, our project was funded by, uh, started out with the USDA IFAS uh, program that uh, Frank and others and I uh, uh, shared um, the benefits of funding from. It's also been funded by NRI Managed Ecosystems Program and also from uh, Ohio State. The experiment I'm going to be talking about today we call the fill crop transition experiment. It was established uh, at OARDC in Worcester in, uh, in 2000. And it is a, a part of this larger interdisciplinary program that uh, I have the honor of leading at Ohio State University. It was, this experiment was um, pretty much the flagship experiment, if you will, as this program began at, uh, at OSU and was very much uh, asked for by farmers. Organic farmers and other organic uh, supporters in the state wanted to see, obviously, their land-grant university getting involved in organic research and experiencing the transition process. Uh, the intent was to make this a long-term experiment uh, as probably some of you in the audience are, are, are having direct experience with in terms of, of trying to sustain the funding for these experiments, it can be quite challenging. And uh, we had great uh, support in the beginning. We're hoping to renew that uh, shortly. The experiment was set up to compare what we called organic classic, uh, a four-year organic rotation of corn, soybeans, a small grain, and hay as practice of, um, by a number of our long-term organic farmers in Ohio, in particular Rex Spray. He was a very important mentor uh, for myself and, and, and others of us on, on the team. And we wanted to set this up, or what our farmers wanted was to, uh, to, to compare with what is dominantly on the landscape in Ohio, which is a, a corn and soybean a rotation. We did not do the completely randomized block design that Kathleen used uh, in, in Iowa. We chose to do a randomized block design where we kept the organic blocks, the organic system together, and the conventional system together. So it, it uh, uh, um, gave us more of a systems type of, of uh, experiment design. There are six reps. If I had it to do over again, I would change the block configuration to be longer, and I would, but I would have to sacrifice a number of reps given the, the land resources that we had available to do this. Uh, the goal of this experiment was to build basic understanding of short and long-term ecological changes uh, through transition and to demonstrate this process, uh, evaluate agronomic, economic, and environmental cost and benefits. Uh, we did have very strong and very important uh, organic farming advisors uh, as we actually began managing this as well as in the planning. I'm not going to go through the details here, but you see some of the management differences. Uh, uh, like other universities, we followed the standard state agronomic uh, practices as term, in terms of our conventional uh, system. And then uh, classic organic, which involved a lot of tillage. Um, in our organic system. Down at the bottom, maybe you cannot see this, uh, some of you, but I have highlighted the total number of passes on um, um, our corn and, and our, I'm sorry, on the soybeans. And for the conventional system, three passes over the field because we did use a no-till system here and Roundup Ready soybeans as was being practiced, is being practiced by our conventional farmers, as opposed to nine passes for the organic system. There were some years that that number even went higher uh, in the organic system. And uh, the tillage is quite significant, as, as we've heard. Another very significant factor for us is uh, giant ragweed. 
And how many of you know about giant ragweed? <laughs> well, not many. Those of you that don't <laughs> do everything possible to avoid it. Uh, Ambrosia trifida is a native species. There is a uh, relatively new biotype that acts like, a, like an invasive, uh, and it, it, it is quite, quite significant challenge for organic farming. Um, the land that we were given to do this work had been in conventional corn for 15 years. Um, it has uh, herbicide resistant populations. Another factor is that uh, some of the fields that, not, not this experiment, but we inherited fields from a weed ecologist. And those of you that know what weed ecologists do, <laughs> they plant weed seeds. <laughs> So I like to say Kathleen has this wonderful, bright, light uh, story of transition. Uh, Ohio has seen the dark side. And if we can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Most of our work in this experiment, and what I'm going to be sharing with you today, focuses on the soil ecosystem. Uh, one of the things that we were very interested in uh, uh, dealt with carbon sequestration. And this is just a slide pointing out some of the obvious things that relate to carbon sequestration in, in uh, farming systems, and, and particular organic systems. The higher organic matter inputs uh, through livestock manure, compost, uh, our longer rotations with the small grains and the forage crops, our cover crops, uh, those are all things that work to our favor. Obviously, the tillage factor is something that works against us. Um, and then the fossil fuel cost here, uh, we do have more passes across the field, uh, obviously the pesticide use, and these are all things, these are just factors that, uh, that we, we've thought about as, as we've done this work. Now, when we um, began doing this experiment and monitoring our carbon data, I was all excited because organic was winning, and I'm an organic researcher. But uh, when we actually corrected the data for bulk density, we found that our statistical differences disappeared both for total organic carbon as well as for particular organic uh, carbon. Uh, what we do see is they track higher. The way I look at that at this point is given all of the tillage that we have, and I should have said early on, our soil, this is a, a silt loam, a Worcester silt loam is our soil type. It's a good soil. Uh, certainly not as good as, as uh, further west of us out in Iowa, but good for our area. Um, in spite of all the tillage, we're able to maintain um, at least as high, if not somewhat higher, carbon levels. Now, carbon is not all created equal. Uh, we had a graduate student, an analytical chemistry graduate student, work with us um, as part of this project and looked at the actual carbon uh, structure, uh, uh, or the structures of the different types of carbon in our soils. And basically what he found is that uh, through the transition process, in both the conventional and the transitional, we saw increase in, in carbohydrates and proteins to some degree, but really no difference when we looked at the transitional and the, uh, the conventional soils. Uh, both were high in carbohydrates. There was no real difference in terms of the type of carbon. In terms of sequestering, we want to shift more toward uh, the lignans and the type of carbon that goes into the humus fraction that, um, uh, for example, Sir Albert Howard uh, played, uh, placed great emphasis. There's still a lot more work to be done research-wise in this area. In terms of nitrogen, um, we see that the mineral forms of nitrogen uh, ran higher in, in the conventional system than the organic system. And I think this slide shows it uh, better. We, we found higher levels of uh, microbial, what we call microbial biomass nitrogen in the organic system, reflecting the shift in the nitrogen cycle to a more biological, more biological basis. There were a lot of other soil parameters that we looked at uh, that I'm not showing the data, but uh, bulk density and soil penetrance did not differ between the systems. Uh, we worked with an agriculture engineer that did the depth uh, penetration measures, and I was quite surprised, actually, very pleasantly surprised, given all the tillage, that he was not able to find uh, significant differences in soil penetrance between the two systems. 
pH, uh, total nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and copper all became significantly higher. Uh, aluminum was significantly lower. Now, just a little bit of, uh, um, uh, I don't know about you folks, but when I was growing up, I loved to look at all the little bugs in the soil. I was always turning over stones and, and uh, looking at what was there. So we did uh, engage some, uh, some of the uh, uh, soil ecologists to, to look. Starting at the, the microscopic level, we had a postdoc, Dr. Jerome Rigaud, uh, under the, uh, um, the tutelage of, uh, of Dr. Fred Michelle, do DNA fingerprinting analysis. Um, and we were very excited about this. Um, it was extremely expensive, part of our IFAS project. And um, disappointingly, we really found no difference in the, the uh, genetic composition between the two systems um, during the time that this work was done. And there's probably different factors that may be involved there. I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the, this is actually looking at the community structure using similarity indices and um, there was no difference. The nematodes, however, and the nematodes uh, are a very important indicator group for the overall soil food web, show very striking uh, shifts right from the start. Um, from our baseline data to the, the first sampling, we saw a um, drastic reduction in the number of plant parasitic nematodes in the Pratolinchus uh, species in the, um, the transitional system. Um, and then the ratio between the free-living beneficial species and these plant parasitic um, systems also changed. I had a graduate student that did a study on the whole uh, nematode community and basically uh, confirmed what the initial uh, results were with respect to a decrease in the plant parasitic uh, species in the organic system, increase in bacteriovores, but an important difference that again comes back to this tillage factor. He saw no difference in uh, the structure index, which it would be an indicator if indeed that was greater in the organic system of more complexity and a higher uh, level of soil functioning from the nematodes perspective. That was not different between the two systems and they attribute that to uh, all the tillage in the organic system. We also had a, um, a microarthropod uh, entomologist working with us. And um, again, we found various results, but um, the one group, the mesostigmatids and, and the prostigs on the bottom, these are both uh, predatory species of mites that can be very important in terms of helping for biological control of, of soil uh, pest. And these uh, increased in particular uh, one genus, the Europodinas, there was, that was a very strong response to the added organic matter in particular in the form of, of manure that we use as fertility in our organic system. So in uh, uh, overall conclusions, overall system differences between our two systems uh, were not as great as expected, although the organic system tracks somewhat higher than the conventional system for some parameters. Uh, from the perspective of carbon sequestration, carbon lost in the extra tillage uh, appeared to be offset by carbon additions. Lack of change in the gross microbial community composition uh, may be due to methodological limitations or may, may be that changes in management affected uh, the catabolic capabilities of microbial but not the community structure and diversity. Um, while transition increased populations of beneficial nematodes and decreased plant parasitic nematodes, excessive tillage may have prevented buildup of tillage sensitive omnivores and predatory nematodes that contribute to the structure index. Um, like a lot of other places, we are trying uh, to get into uh, reduced tillage uh, research, and we certainly thank uh, Rodell for their leadership in this. This is very, very important. This is one of the big lessons, certainly, that I've learned from this. And because some of the e economists yesterday were, or the production people were slipping in uh, environmental results, I thought I would just slip in. <laughs> Um, we did have an economist working with us, and, um, and so that's card-carrying data. So what, what I've done here is take 
uh, data from um, uh, from Dr. Marvin Bad is the is the economist that worked with us at Ohio State, and I just took a theoretical hundred acre farm and using our actual numbers and 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 his numbers calculated of uh, what the difference would be in terms of overall profitability. And this does include labor uh, in terms of return to the farm family uh, on that 100 acres managed conventionally versus organically for, uh, this was for 2004 price data and such. And uh, the bottom line is that roughly $8,000 more a return toward uh, the, the, uh, the whole farm. And another added social thing, I just realized this morning, I've got to change this slide. This, this young man is one of our organic dairy farm, uh, the son of one of our organic dairy farm families that we've worked with quite a bit. But I'm a new grandmother, so I can put my own grandson's picture. <laughs> and he does eat organic food. <laughs> anyway, certainly um, the health of our children, um, as they grow is such an incredibly important uh, aspect on the social dimension as, as well as the nutrition science and that type of thing. Um, and then of course the planet. And uh, the quote uh, for those of you who do not know is from my late husband. Thank you.